So let's go over this do now. And this question has a lot to do with today's or tomorrow's lab, depending upon what period you have. And what we're going to do is we're going to look and see the values given to us in lab. So you're going to do this exact lab, this exact problem in lab. Now, you had problems with this if you did not do your homework, which was, which was questions 7 and 8 of the previous worksheet that I had a video reviewing the question and I had a key posted. Please use those resources because your quiz this week will have a question like this, which is like your lab, which is like the lecture. My gosh, it goes together. Oshkosh, bagosh. Any case, let's continue. So the first step is I'm going to look at my data and I'm trying to build the chemical formula of my hydrate. My hydrate is sodium carbonate hydrate, but they didn't tell me how many waters. I knew it was sodium carbonate and I should know that sodium is plus one at this point, but if I don't, I can go to the periodic table and boom, there it is. Now, if you don't know where sodium is, it's an active metal, it's an alkali metal, it's over here and there it is in all its glory. It likes to become plus one. Please look, do not guess at this point. So let's go back. That's how I know sodium is plus one. What about the carbonate? It doesn't end in I, so it's not just an element. It's a polyatomic ion. It's got a name. So what the heck is it? So I go to the what the heck is that table, which I call table E to figure that out. And hopefully this is not the first time you've looked at this reference table. But if you have and not looked at it before, we're going to scroll down to our table E. Okay, and we're going to go find what a carbonate is. What the heck is that is table E and all these clusters of normally non-metals. There's some metals there. Okay, these clusters of things that are usually bonded covalently. And I'm just wasting time until I find it. And the carbonate, I think, is right here. There it is. So it's a cluster of one carbon and three oxygens. Treat this as a single entity. The whole thing is negative two. Can you say two? I heard you. No, I didn't. So let's continue. Now I've got the carbonate of two. I crisscross. I need two sodiums for one carbonate. I do not know how many waters, so I'm going to have to figure out that from the data. So here's what I did. I took the mass of the empty crucible. I took the mass of the empty crucible and the cover and the hydrate. So I'm sorry. The mass of the empty crucible and cover is 15.370. That's just like your first lab. Then we put some hydrate in it. It got a little heavier. The difference of these two numbers is your hydrate. Okay, we took this and we heated it. We drove off the water, it got lighter. Imagine that, it lost the water, it got lighter, amazing. Okay, then we keep heating it some more because we don't know if we drove off the water until we keep heating and it stays the same. And looky here, it does stay the same, which tells me that we've driven off the water. We kept what? Heating, massing and heating until these numbers stay about the same. In this case, they did because I made the problem. <laughs> okay, and then if I take that 18.44, which is lighter than the original, I'm going to subtract out the cover and crucible, I get the dried compound called the anhydrate. So what do I have going on here? Well, I've got the hydrate, which in this case is Na2CO3, and I don't know the numbers of water, so I'm going to leave that blank. Then I have an arrow and I'm going to make the dried compound. I know that's Na2CO3. That's the anhydrate. And of course, I'm going to drive off some number of water molecules. There's an equation. Once I know this number, I can plug it in here and I'm done. That's what we're doing. So I got the anhydrate. Well, we know that this is the compound with the water. Hey, that's the anhydrate. This is the mass of the anhydrate. Hey, that's this. This has water, this doesn't. So what do you do? You subtract both like you've done in the first lab and you get grams of water. So 5.310 in magenta is the grams of water. And 3.074 is the grams of the anhydrate. I want to know how many of these per these. I'm going to build a chemical formula. So I take the grams. Notice we don't have any percentages here. We're not assuming a 100 gram sample. Don't be a robot. You're skipping that step because you already have the grams, which is a how heavy number. And what do we do here? We convert to a how many number. We convert to our moles, which is we get from using the formula, or I should say the mass, from the periodic table. All right, so I'm taking my water and I'm dividing by 18. How do I do that? Why do I use 18? Because water is what? H2O. One oxygen is 16 from the periodic table. Each H is one apiece, and the formula mass is 18. 
and I get 0.295 moles of water, which is just an equivalent. Now, I take my sodium carbonate, that's my dried compound, my anhydrate, that's left in the crucible, and I find its formula mass, the converting factor to get to a mole, and there's my work, two sodiums and carbon, I get 106, and then I convert that to moles, which is some equivalent. Now, divide by the smaller number to get a ratio of how many, and 0.029 is a smaller number, so you divide that by itself, you get 1, and you take this big number, divide by the small number, and you get about 10, 10.17 you can round. So in this case, you're always going to see numbers that you can round to the whole number. So in lab today, you're going to do this. And when you get a scenario like this, just round to the nearest whole number, like we did, and we get 10. And we're done. We can move on to the next question. No. This 10 tells me that I have what? I have 10 waters. To, to build my chemical formula, okay, what I've got to do is I've got to put my 10 there. And once I have my 10, right, there's 10 waters per what? One anhydrate. So there's what? One anhydrate, one of these, per 10 of these. And that, party people, is how you figure out the formula of a hydrate. You use the hydrate stuff that you did, find percentages, or find, in this case, find the grams. And we built the chemical formula by building the how many ratios. The key to the entire problem of course, going through the hydrate data was understanding your grams, all right, have to be converted into moles, which is a how many number. And we do that by using the formula mass that we did the first day together. So that is the answer. And that's a question you should see this week on a quiz. This is what we're going to review and do in a lab. So now we're going to start today's new lesson, but it builds on everything we've done. We've spent time build, talking about ratio of, let's say, molecules inside a chemical formula. Don't lose sight that right here is a chemical formula of a hydrate. It's a salt, an ionic compound, plus with the minuses and some ratio that makes it zero with some number of water molecules locked inside the crystal. So this is the entire chemical formula. So we were building that. Now we're going to start looking at entire reactions and looking not at the ratios inside a chemical formula, but the ratio between atoms or molecules in a chemical reaction. And this stems from something called the law of conservation of mass. And we need to understand, anytime we're talking about the law of conservation of mass, we're dealing with molecules or atoms in reactions, and we're looking to do something called balance them. And it's very important why we do that. So the law of conservation of mass is nothing more than the idea that atoms or molecules are what? Neither, and you should write this, created or destroyed. Yes, you should be writing it. Especially the person in the back with the head down. Get your head up, 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 up. Okay, good. Neither created nor destroyed. Now, well, why? Well, why is that true? You know, what does that mean, either created or destroyed? Well, here's what I want to do. I want to make water. And by the way, hydrogen, the word hydrogen means in Greek, water maker. There's a piece of information that will never come useful to you at any point in time in your life. But in any case, let's draw what's happening here. Here's hydrogen bonded to itself. So I'm going to draw an H bonded to an H. It's called molecular diagrams, which you have to do for the regions. Here's an O2. An O2 is a little bigger, actually it's 16 times more massive, that's why the atomic mass of oxygen is 16, it's a little bigger. Now, we're going to make a bigger molecule. One of these red circles, which is oxygen, becomes two little blue circles. Hey, we made water, that's cool, we're done, we go forward. Wait, well, wait a minute, I took two hydrogens and one oxygen, I left an oxygen unreacted. That means I'm going to have an oxygen hanging out over here. I just see H2O. I don't see H2O plus an oxygen. That's not how it works. So to make just water, I can't work this way. There's no way. So what people say is, well, just get rid of it. Okay, get rid of it. Then what you're saying is two oxygens eventually become one oxygen. We lose an oxygen going left to right. What did I just state? That mass is neither what? Created nor destroyed. You can't just make up an atom on one side or destroy one to make it balance. 
you have to have the same number and the same type of atoms on both sides. So, in order for them to make this work, another oxygen has to be part of another water molecule. The only way. Wait a minute, so we've used this oxygen. This makes another water molecule, but we're out of hydrogens. Well, if you haven't figured it out, if, if, I can speak. <laughs> if you can't figure it out already, it's going to be another hydrogen pair or another hydrogen, quote, molecule. And they go here. You get the little Mickey Mouse ears. So what just happened here? I needed to add another hydrogen or H2 particle to make all of this work. And if you notice, how many oxygens? There's two oxygens on the reactant side, these react, and there's two oxygens on the product side. That's the product side. It's the P and the R. All right? And the reactants react and you make products. And what's also happening is we have four hydrogen atoms and we have one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms. So that's how it works. But if you notice in my reaction, I've got nothing in front of the H2. Nothing in front means you have one, right? If I have an apple, you'd have to say it's one apple. So what we need to reflect this number is I need a two here to show I need two of these. And of course, a one here reflects one of these. And didn't I make two of these molecules? Yeah, so I put a two here. My friends in chemistry, we just balanced. And when we balance, what we do is we make good cake. And it sounds silly, but when we make good cake, it means that we have put together the correct ratio ingredients to have the most correct or the best reaction possible. If I put this together this way, you notice I don't have any waste, unlike the way you did before, and all my atoms are accounted for. But this means even more. As a chemist, I just don't mix molecules and atoms and compounds together and hope I get a reaction. I want to know the exact ratio. When you cook, you don't mix just the flour haphazardly with the sugar and anything else you want to throw in to make pancakes. No, you have to have the right ratios. If you're making cake, and that's what I used, Cake's not going to taste good if you just throw as much flour as you want because some of it might be unreacted. Ooh, unreacted flour is nasty. So we don't want that. We want to make good cakes. We have to make sure that we have a two to one ratio so that all the atoms are together. So the reason why we balance, yes, to follow the law of conservation of a matter, but to find these ratios. Now notice when I balanced, I put a whole number called a coefficient in front, I do not arbitrarily change this. I can't say, hey, take this away. Uh-uh. All I did was put numbers in front. Now, when I balance reactions, what I'm coming up with is these coefficients or ratios that tell me what's the proper amount of each to, to maximize the reaction with no waste. So what I'm going to do here is I would like to pause, and I want to take you through um, a couple of my movies or we'll do a demonstration in lab. Now if the demonstration doesn't go forward we will continue with this part. So I'm going to play a demonstration that I did uh, about a week or two ago and what I did is I made three hydrogen filled balloons and I exploded them. I, lighted, I lit them up and they reacted with the oxygen. Now I made them with different ratios. I made them with well poor ratios and then I finally made one with a great ratio. Now we know from balancing that the balanced ratio will give me the best bang, the best explosion, the reaction with less unreacted elements. If everything, if all the hydrogens can find the right number of oxygens with that two to one ratio, I'll get the best bang. So I'm going to play this and we'll see if you can listen very carefully to the explosions and to how they explode, um, how quickly they explode. Let's see if our balanced reaction or two to one ratio is the best. So here we go. Like I'm lighting the first balloon, which is 100% uh, oxygen. Sorry, 100% hydrogen. Look, this, of course, is in slow mo. Mm. 
Okay, that was the first balloon. Now, I want to stop that for a second. Look how it blows out. Look how it blows out. So it blew outward. The hydrogen, for it to react, had to find the oxygen in the air, so it blew outward. Okay, there's me running. Okay, and it blew outward, looking for it. So this wasn't the best explosion because there was no oxygen inside. There's probably a lot of unreacted hydrogen. So it was more of a burn than an explosion, but there was a pop. Let's go to the second one. I love the slow-mo sounds. Okay, that was an 80-20. That one with a little more pop in it. And let's look at this one. This blew not so much outward. It, okay, it did. It, it blew out a little bit, but it was more contained, I believe. It was a little louder. Okay, if you could hear that difference. Okay, I'm not sure if you can, but because there was some what? There was some oxygen. Now we want a two to one. This was an 80-20. Okay, so this was a um, a one to four ratio, or in this case, four to one. Not quite what we balanced. So it worked. It was louder. It blew more brilliantly. But let's go wait for the third one. So the third one, here it comes. Now, 66% to 33 is a 2 to 1. So check this one out. That's good cake. Let's try that one again. Yeah, that shook the science wing. Yeah, that's, that's a good ratio, 2 to 1. Every hydrogen reacted because it was enough oxygen. Okay, this was the second one. This was somewhere. The first one. First one. Second one. A little louder, right? And, of course, the granddaddy of all explosions, the 2 to 1 ratio. Good cake. So what kind of reaction is this? This, of course, is there's four basic types, and we'll go over them as we see them. But essentially, I have two things coming together to make something. A fancy word for making something is synthesizing. So this is called a synthesis reaction. Write it down. How do I know? When I see two or more things coming together, to make a bigger thing or combining them together, that's a synthesis. So you see one or two or more things coming together to make one, you're synthesizing, you're making it. it makes sense. Okay? Now before I, get, I continue on, I just have to talk about a couple of different types of scenarios. I hope you understand why we balance. Now this is a chemistry class and sometimes this stuff is boring, but there's real life implications. For those that follow the space program, the space shuttle is no longer in service. But one of the fuels it used to get into space was liquid, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. This is the liquid oxygen fuel tank. It goes up top. If you notice below, this is the hydrogen tank. This, I know it's kind of the way it's cut looks smaller, but this is twice as big as this one. I said it again, twice as big because it's a two hydrogen to one ratio. So they lose liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to catapult the space shuttle into space. So there's real life implications to this. Back to work we go. Now look at our synthesis reaction, two things making one. Let's add up the coefficients. Some of the coefficients would be two plus one, three. Three plus two is five. Sometimes I'll ask those things. Now, I wanna make it very clear that you don't have to have a one here, okay? Just having uh, the element implies one. So if you're counting the sum of the coefficients, That'd be, of course, still five. But if you want to put a one there just so you remind yourself, that's fine. But some questions will ask for the sum of the coefficients in their lowest whole number. Okay, let's make this guy. Try number two out. Okay, and number two, I would like you to try to find what would make NH3. Now, notice I took H2O apart. To find what I would do to make H2O, I pulled pure hydrogen and pure oxygen. So I'm going to give you uh, a minute to figure out what the formula would be for this, right? In fact, yeah, we'll just give you a second to see if you can figure it, figure it out. Now you can draw 
okay, these molecular diagrams in a second. But right now, try to figure out what elements make this up. Notice I pulled out the pure hydrogen and the pure oxygen and put them here. Don't worry about balancing. I'll give you a second. Go right now. So let's balance this reaction. We could do the molecular diagram first, like we did here, to see if we can get these numbers. But let's do it the backwards way, which is the way I, we eventually want you to do. We want to balance the reaction. We know why we're doing it, because we want good cake. We want a reaction that tells me the correct ratios. And of course, I don't want to break the law of conservation of mass. OK, well, before we can balance, we have to figure out what our uh, elements are. So you should have realized we had N2 already. And you had H2. You said, Mr. Grotsky, how would you know that these guys bonded with themselves? I know it's nitrogen and hydrogen makes up, but how did you know to make them N2? Well, because whether it's uh, Mr. B Ms. Buffalo or it's Mr. Grotsky or Mr. Burkhout or Mr. Deal, we all use a, a mnemonic very similar. It, I use Hofbrinkel, but Brinkel Hoff someone else used. So Hofbrinkel is a mnemonic that helps us remember the elements that bond with themselves. H2O2, F2, Br2, I2, uh, N2, and I forgot Brinkle. That should be an L. And of course, that too. These guys are diatomic elements. You have to know that when you have a pure element that loves to bond with itself, you have to write it that way. It's the number one reason why people forget when they're balancing these types and predicting equation writing. So that is something that you have to have down. That's a must. Okay, so let's get this stuff out of the way. Now, we have our elements diatomically written. We're going to balance, and when we balance, we put coefficients in front. These coefficients tell me how many of each, because I want good cake. I want to know what the ratio. In the space shuttle, it was a 2 to 1 ratio of hydrogen liquid to oxygen liquid. In my balloons, it was a 2 to 1 that worked the best, obviously. So, let's go find what's going to obviously work the best here. So, I've got two ends right here. I've got one N on this side. Now, when I do this and balance, I look at the reactant side. These are the reactants. They react to make what? Products. And I compare the product side. Having a problem with my parentheses there. So I think it's more like this. There we go. So this is my reactant side and my product side. And when I compare, I have two nitrogens on this side, and I've got one N. So I've got to fix that. And I fix that by putting a coefficient. I throw a 2 here to fix that. Now it's two ends. What I do not do is put a two right here as a subscript. I cannot change the formula to make it balance because this formula, if you remember, is dependent upon the bonding we spent so much time doing. N has five valence, my friends in chemistry. So if you put in the what? The hydrogen's electrons and put the hydrogen in, you can see clearly N is going to bond to just three things because now it has the stable octet. The bonding stuff never leaves you people. It's always going to haunt us if you don't know it. So you can't just do that. You can't just change the chemical formula. You can only put what? Coefficients in front. So because we know it's NH3, this is two, we, we balanced our nitrogens. But we have two hydrogen atoms in the reactant side and we have two times how many? That's a three there. If you count, it's a distributive property. Two n's and two times three, you have six h's on this side. So by balancing the n's, we have unbalanced or created six hydrogens on the product side. How can I make this become a six hydrogens? You guessed it if you guessed correctly, that person in the front row. That is going to be a three, because three times two is six h's. And we don't put nothing in front here, so it's a 1 to 3 to 2 to ra 2 ratio. And that, my friends, would make a great reaction, or as I like to say, that would make good cake. Now, will the molecular diagram support that? Well, we have 1 N2, so let's make the N here, two of them. They're bond to themselves. We have three H2s. Okay, so we got three of these. And we know that. NH3 is 1 N and 3, uh, 3 H's, as we talked about, based on the bonding. So I put my, uh, let's start with the nitrogen. I have one nitrogen, and each nitrogen gets, and you can probably see what's going on here, 3 H's. And I have two of these particles. So I draw another nitrogen with 3 H's, 
holy smoke, if smoke is holy. I guess Vatican smoke is. Any case, um, you have what? Two of these ammonia particles. And you have three of these. This supports it. Look, we have one, two nitrogens, one, two nitrogens. And we have what? One, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens. Of course it works out. That's what this is about. What kind of a reaction is this? Well, two things coming together is called a synthesis. Some of the coefficients, okay, well, 1 plus 3 is 4, 4 plus 2 is 6. All right, so I'm going to stop here, but before I do so, I want to just give you the other three reactions, so I'm not stopping. So as we go on to the back page, I just want to give you other reactions. Now if you look at number three, number three, I have aluminum oxide breaking down into something. Now it's by itself, so it's implying that one thing is going to break, it down, break down into smaller things. Now if you notice, I can draw that, smaller things. So this is going to break down into its elements. Look what we have here. Elements are making the compound. Isn't 1 and 2 the reverse of what I have here? Yeah. This is one thing breaking down decaying. This is decomposition. Okay. And let's quickly do this one. Well, we're going to have aluminum. And then we have oxygen. Am I good? Did I do that right? Ah, oxygen's one of the hot wrinkles. I've got to put an O2 there, party people. Aluminum is not, so I'm good. So, let's balance. Two aluminums. One aluminum. So we want to put what? Put a two there. We have three oxygens. Well, we got two oxygens. How do I deal with that? Three and two. What we do in this scenario is we find a common factor. Between three and two is six. So to get to get six, I'm going to put a three here. Three times two is six oxygens. But to get six oxygens on the products, on the reactant side, that's the, the place we start, I have to put a two in front. That gives me the six oxygens. But two times two is how many aluminums do I have now? That's right, I have four, so I have to erase this. See, balancing, there isn't one way to do it. It's a puzzle, and sometimes you're going to have to scratch, and like I did, start and stop and figure things out. But I know that I have 2 times 2, 4 aluminums. Distribute the 2. 2 times 3 is 6 oxygens. And I know that I'm balanced with a 2 to 4 to 3 ratio. Some of the coefficients, 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 plus 3 is 9. Okay, so this I'm going to stop here, and this should be enough for this period. If you want to go forward, you cannot because you need the second lecture, which I'll have posted.